All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, so before we get started today, I want everyone to take a few seconds and just briefly picture an engineer. Think about who you see, where they are, what they're doing. Everybody have their mental picture? All right. How many of you pictured someone wearing a white lab coat working in a lab? Okay. How many people pictured someone at a construction site or wearing a hard hat? All right. Google agrees with you. If you do a Google image search for engineers, lots of hard hats. Um, how many of you pictured a man? Okay. How many of you pictured a person of color? Okay. Um, so that's what I wanted to talk about today is sort of what our ideas are about who engineers are, what engineering is, and how that relates to student interest in engineering. So workforce data shows that there is a meaningful need for both more and more diverse engineers in the US. Um, however, it's often difficult to get students interested in engineering as a process or as a possible career path. Um, and that may happen for a variety of reasons. One reason is that students may lack understanding or awareness of what engineers do particularly of the scope and breadth of questions and problems that engineers address. Contributing to this, science teachers, who might be some of the best people to get students interested in engineering, are trained to teach science, not engineering. And so they may sometimes not do as good of a job as they could of connecting scientific questions and problems to engineering solutions when they talk with students. Students may also have negative perceptions of engineers or engineering. They may view engineering as a field that's lonely, that's boring, or that doesn't really help people or contribute meaningfully to society. Students may also be discouraged by the lack of diversity they see in the engineering field. Engineering is a field that is primarily still dominated by white and Asian men. Um, and students may not be as interested in fields if they don't see others like them being engaged in that. So I wanna to talk to you today about a program here at KU that is designed to promote greater interest among in, in engineering among students, particularly middle and high school students by getting their teachers involved with research that's going on here on campus. So this is an NSF funded project and the title is a mouthful Inquiry Driven Engineering Activities Using Bioengineering yeah, Examples. We call it IDEA BioE for short. Um, and it's a six week summer program that involves pre service and practicing teachers. And through this program, the pre service and practicing teachers work at labs here at KU that are focused on research related to bioengineering. So these projects include things like creating and testing medical devices creating environmentally friendly building materials, and promoting stability and efficacy of medications and vaccines. Along with their research experience, teachers participate in weekly pedagogy workshops, and these workshops are specifically designed to address those barriers to student interest in engineering that I talked about before. So for example, we help teachers to better understand the engineering design process, talk about strategies for promoting a view of engineering as a career that involves collaboration and uh, working with others and also benefits other people. Um, and we talk about emphasizing the contributions of women and people of color to the engineering field. And then based on these experiences, the participating teachers develop classroom modules based on their research experience, translating that experience into something that's going to be useful in the middle or high school classroom. And then the practicing teachers put those modules into place in their classrooms in the coming academic year. Um, we're currently working on collecting and analyzing some data on those teachers' students to learn about the impact of the program on those students' knowledge of and attitudes about engineering. Um, and we're also about to start recruiting our cohort of participating teachers um, for this upcoming summer. So if you know of any pre-service teachers you think might be interested or might be a good fit for this program, please let me know. And with that, I will open it up for questions. Yes, Ngandi? So this is a grant that is comes through, so I'm on it, Doug Huffman around here somewhere is on it, and then uh, Praj Nadar from the uh, School of Engineering. So it's officially run through the School of Engineering, but involves engineering and education faculty. 
Lisa? Yes, sorry. <laughs> We've done two rounds so far. We have one, one or possibly two more rounds. We may do a no cost extension. We haven't done observations of the teachers partly because the school district is not a super fan of letting us do that. Um, but we do have, we have data from the participating teachers and we have survey data from their students. We were not able to go in and observe in the classrooms, although we did want to do that. It wasn't possible. <laughs> yeah, Rick. I didn't ask who imagined a tr someone driving a train, although that is an option. <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, and I think I think that actually shows the challenge of getting students interested in engineering. I think there are a lot of students who do imagine someone driving a train, right? Or like people like my dad. My dad started off college as an engineering major because he knew that's what you majored in if you were good at math. And that's basically all he knew, right? Um, and so we need students to have more of a sense of what engineering is and the breadth and scope of it if we do want to get a greater variety of students interested in engineering and choosing the major and so on. Yeah, Ngami? Are these teachers from around here? The teachers, yes, the teachers are from around here. So this is a local program. The pre-service teachers are all from KU. Um, the practicing teachers are from a variety of different local districts. We've had teachers from Topeka, from Olathe, um, so yeah, we have, it's, but it's all local. Yeah. Yeah, we can talk about that. Absolutely. Yeah. Other questions? All right. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Sean Smith, faculty member here in the department of special education. Uh, Lisa, thank you so much for facilitating this. Jeannie, wherever you are, thank you much for organizing us, uh, and especially me. I really appreciate that. Um, so this format was not made for me. Uh, five minutes, uh, that's, that's just uh, not me, as Jenny and Jamie would know in the back, but uh, I'll try. So it all starts with a problem, though, and this is research funded by the U.S. Department of Education, Office of Special Education Programs, and my colleagues that I'm representing here are Dr. Amber Rowland, Dr. Maggie Mosier, Dr. Bruce Fry. And our problem that we started off with, and I thought I'd visualize it, and yes, it's a bit simplistic with Sheldon. But for those of us that know Sheldon and the Big Bang Theory, he definitely has some social challenges in terms of his ability to communicate. Uh, and yes, they tend to be humorous, but the reality is we have a lot of learners that have uh, social emotional uh, challenges, uh, social competence challenges. Honestly, depending upon the state you live in, like in Florida, it's no longer SEL. I'm not sure what they use, but that's no longer allowed based on the legislator. But we know post-pandemic particularly, these are serious challenges. These are challenges that affect pre-K through 12, higher education, and also employment opportunities. If we don't develop these skills, uh, Megan was just talking about engineering. I think it's a top two skill in terms of social competence to be a successful engineer. So that's the problem. Now, of course, we're focused on individuals with disabilities, particularly with autism, which is a very significant problem. It's part of their attribute, part of who they are. Now, we could go about with solutions. Well, let's stay with the Sheldon theme, and we'll have a, an algorithm for making friends. And uh, there's an episode where he walks you through how to do it. It actually kind of makes sense, but we're not going to go in that direction. We're going to go with actually proven curriculum. And there's social-emotional curriculum that is being introduced, particularly across our schools. There are standards to be able to affiliate it. Uh, Patty Noonan, Amy Gomer, uh, colleagues in LSI have done extensive work in this area, as well as probably other people I'm just unfamiliar with here at KU. But we took a different track. We, we took the idea that there's curriculum, but we thought, well, how do you give an opportunity for learners? Learners that need contextualization, learners that need practice, learners that need a safety element to be able to, for lack of a better word, crash and burn. And think of it. I want you to socially interact. I want you to give eye contact. I want you to be able to express yourself. I want you to be able to respond. How many opportunities are you going to get to do that in a given day where someone will stop you and say, try it again, try it again, try it again, especially with children. So we went to the virtual reality experience and we went there particularly because of the kind of fact we wanted the opportunity for the individual to be able to gain knowledge and skills, to contextualize it, to visualize it, to practice it, to hopefully also then gain ability to generalize. So for the last several years, we've been working within virtual reality. Now, many of you may think, a wearable. And yes, the Oculus is up there. 
But our primary users out in the classroom are Google Chromebooks, iPads, Windows. And so we've placed it all there. And yes, that's less immersive, but it's still a simulation, still a game for the individuals to interact with. And so we took that and there's 140 scenarios. We created 180 plus skills. It's reliable, it's valid. We've researched it across several different ways. Happy to clarify that in uh, questions. But the reality is that there's still this level of seamlessness, this level of interaction. Now, some virtual reality, Lisa Deeker, a colleague of ours in the Department of Special Education, she's done a lot of this work in pre-service and teacher education. And there's a person on the other end responding too. Now, we wanted that freedom where that doesn't exist. So how do you make it more seamless? How do you make it more interactive and allowing the user to have that automatic response? Well, that's where artificial intelligence comes in. And so we've taken this work that we have good evidence on, and now we're bringing in artificial intelligence, first from the language learning model in, in respect to, as I respond as a user, the machine will learn and respond back appropriately. And of course, there's appropriate ways, there's language to use, there's responses, but also what about my emotions? How do I look at you? How do I respond back? We're utilizing that same AI technology to make this much more seamless, much more interactive. So the individual, there's no pause to look at text. There's no pause to be able to have to respond. It's much more seamless as you would in any natural environment. And we're calling that I know. So the current project, Voice, as you can see, and yes, we do need help from Barbara Bradley and others in terms of phonological awareness and decoding because that's boss, not voice, or however you want to pronounce it. But uh, that virtual reality experience, we're now calling I know, that's a whole nother acronym. But those domains you see at the very end cover those 10 areas, cover pretty much the gamut on the social competence, social skill issues that we're trying to address uh, throughout the pre-K through 12, I'd argue here in the collegiate as well as post-collegiate. So with that, I'll offer opportunity for questions and thank you for the opportunity to present. There you go. That took a little practice, which is not my norm either. So, yes, question. Yes. Yep. So, sure. So there's a question about seamlessness, and so, and it was. A, I'll, I'll start there. Right now, our current experience is we're stopping the individual in the middle of a scenario. And like I said, we have 140 scenarios covering those 10 domains. And as they go through, they're, they're stopped. And, and by the way, they have a, a narrator, uh, a, a, a social coach, so to speak, kind of walking them through elements. But as they're stopped, they're presented with questions. They have to respond to those questions. And based on how they respond, they're given a pathway, which is much very naturalistic. But in and of itself, the first part is having to be stopped and being asked a series of questions that they have to respond to. We want to make that, we want to get those questions out of the way and instead, there's avatars already pre-programmed where the avatars are asking the questions, the teacher's asking the questions. So for example, right now we have scenarios where the avatars will turn to the user and ask, and the user now is having to respond via text or something along those. No, we want it to be able to respond verbally. And then the avatars based on how they respond will be pre-programmed to take them this direction, this direction, this direction along the way. So that's one aspect. But we also want it to be in terms of not only verbally, but how are they reacting? So the system can see how they're reacting and also react to that seamlessly as well. And so those are two critical elements within the AI that we're utilizing to make that much more seamless and interactive, if that helps. Other questions? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so as, as, as you asked, uh, I'm sorry, your name? Brian? Is, Brian? As Brian asked, in terms of a lot of social uh, interactions are culturally specific and, and very relevant. Uh, this next stage of funding, we hope to incorporate that more in. Currently, what we've done is we focus in on, as I mentioned before, our primary funding is for individuals with disabilities. So we really focus in on how individuals with autism particularly respond to where the challenges and how they tend to respond to. But you're right, in terms of eye contact, in terms of spacing and things of that nature, uh, we're trying to, we are working with um, some schools in uh, Arizona and New Mexico, uh, Native American, and we're very much looking to collect data from them to be able to alter elements to be more responsive to those situations as well. Uh, we also are seeking funding through the Bureau of, um, uh, I never say it right, but Bureau of Indian Affairs, but in their education element to be able to not only have it translated into Navajo, 
but also then have situations very specific to that population. We're waiting on funding for that, but we're very aware of that. Um, but again, our thrust is individuals on the spectrum that we're trying to identify and, and focus in on. So, but excellent question. So, other questions? I know I'm probably running out of my time. Question asked, uh, had not asked, but uh, I'll answer it. Is it effective, Sean? We've actually looked at it in a variety of different ways. We looked at levels of immersion and we're finding levels of immersion, iPad versus fully immersive, there's no significant difference. They, they grow, they grow in the realism, they grow in understanding this is, they are there, they have presence. They're growing in measures that we measure for uh, social skill and social competence from pre post. And we just finished a study, uh, Dr. Maggie Moser's dissertation, compared it against peers. And for those in the special ed world, they know that's a highly effective video modeling social skill intervention. And we are quite effective against that. In, in my language, we, we blew them out of the water. But uh, there was a, a Bruce's language, there was a significance in terms of uh, difference in outcomes. So uh, we're very happy with that type of uh, outcome. So, yeah, thank you. Yep, I'd be happy. So, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Jeannie, for uh, organizing this. My name is Brian Gordon. I'm in the sport management program. And what I'm presenting today is some preliminary research on sport logo redesign and rebranding. Okay, so how this kind of got started was um, I saw a statistic uh, a while back that 50% of NBA teams have modified uh, in the mic. Um, 50% of NBA teams have modified or changed their logo since 2017, 2018. So we started to look at the sport logo redesign and rebranding literature, and there wasn't a ton out there. Um, but the one thing we did find was there's two different types uh, of rebrands or redesigns. There's evolutionary and there's revolutionary. So that was kind of our starting point. So evolutionary rebrands are where a team makes minor modifications to their primary logo they might you know change little things about you know the font the design maybe they're trying to make it look better on merchandise or make it look better in a digital medium revolutionary rebrands are where you're really changing your primary colors your font your um, overall design in a significant manner so think uh, a team that a franchise that might relocate for example uh, they might go from being uh, the seattle sonics to the oklahoma thunder that would be uh, a revolutionary rebrand, or like I said, just significant changes to their primary logo. So um, initially our research team looked at that first and judging by the characteristics, we put um, those teams into rather evolutionary or revolutionary category. So on that, that vertical axis, all the ones to the left, we can classify as evolutionary, all the ones to the right, revolutionary. But the second thing we are really interested in is did they take a retro uh, approach to rebranding and redesigning or did they take more of a modern approach? So how we wanted to tackle this element was we surveyed 350 NBA fans and we had them look at all 30 primary logos in the NBA. And basically on a one to seven Likert scale, we asked them to say, uh, do you classify this logo as retro, as a one or modern or as a seven or somewhere in between? So. If you look at that horizontal, uh, all the ones that are up on the top there, uh, according to 350 NBA fans, they perceived uh, those primary logos to be more retro. And then like uh, the opposite, um, all those logos on the bottom, they perceived to be a more modern rebrand. And then the ones to the far right and the top right, uh, they just haven't changed their logo almost ever. You know, So it's been a very static uh, retro approach. Or the ones on the bottom, they said were they looked modern, but they really haven't changed uh, their logo in a significant amount of time. Uh, so that's kind of where we started. We want to categorize these different rebrands according to you know small changes, large changes. Do you consider it retro or modern? And then the last thing we asked them was uh, rate the amount you like the logo from one dislike to seven like, because we are curious to see. Uh, how NBA fans perceive primary logos of NBA teams. A couple of really interesting findings um, from this that we've seen preliminary. So let me take the uh, Minnesota Timberwolves in the, as an example. Uh, they changed their logo a couple of years back uh, in a very elaborate manner, and they wanted to bring back elements of their inaugural logo, which I do have a prop. 
It's right here. Uh, this is their inaugural logo. They wanted to bring back the wolf head. They wanted to bring back the green. Um, so they looked at this as um, a very retro rebrand. However, uh, our initial results when the NBA fans were looking at it were saying, no, this is more of a modern looking logo, which was interesting and ran counter to what the Wolves were doing. Another example, the Utah Jazz, uh, they scrapped their purple color. They scrapped the mountains. They were going extremely modern, black, yellow uh, as their primary logo. We thought that was going to be a modern approach. As you can see, it was a retro approach. So um, that was kind of surprising to us, given how the uh, organization had positioned it um, and, and, and how that kind of actually turned out. One minute. Uh, and then one last example, and probably my favorite example, the Kings went all the way back to their Cincinnati Royals roots. Um, and there was a ball and a crown. And they were going to try and bring that uh, type of rebrand back and, and take a retro approach. But as you can see, at least in our uh, survey, uh, the Kings were considered more of a, a modern primary logo. So this is just kind of the initial stages uh, of what we're doing. We kind of, obviously, what we want to look at is um, if you're in one of these quadrants, uh, what is the value add to doing it? What is the best approach for rebranding? Uh, how does it impact merchandise sales? How does it impact uh, how people think, feel, and act on behalf of the brand? Uh, so I just want to present this, um, you know, kind of first look at how we're trying to classify uh, different uh, rebrands, and we use the MBA context. So thank you. Uh, you know, not really in terms of the teams in the four different quadrants. Yeah. Uh, not really. I have my handy statistics sheet here. And I was we were kind of hoping to see, for example, um, did fans maybe like one quadrant more than the other? Right. Was there some kind of consistent theme? And there was really only one. Um, the, the five most liked logos, four of them came from one of the quadrants. Anybody have an idea which one it might be? which quadrant was probably highest rated in terms of how they liked the logos. Four out of the five came from one quadrant. Uh, so it's hard to see, but up in the top right hand corner, it's retro heritage, Bulls, Lakers, Knicks, Celtics were four out of the top five in terms of most liked. And we thought that was really interesting when you think about um, for me, anyway, when I think about the psychological baggage you bring when you're looking at a logo, it's not just the logo. You have six championships. You have Michael Jordan, right? And I think some of that is coming into play with it. So we kind of labeled those as like heritage brands. They're strong. They haven't changed over time. Oddly, the fifth one um, is the Memphis Grizzlies. And for the life of me, I have no explanation for why that one was in the top five. Um, one other interesting thing was the least liked logos, um, almost all of them had, were viewed as modern, um, which as a retro researcher, I love that, right? So the least liked ones and probably had something to do with the team, the record, success, history, and all that. But uh, mm -hmm. yes. I didn't get to make the joke, but I was going to say I had a jazz shirt under here, too, to show you the original jazz logo as well. Other questions? Yeah, Mike? Yeah, so that is literally our next step. Um, we, we did this, we created this data, we said, okay, now what in the heck are we gonna do with it? Um, and I think like looking at uh, the year before they did a rebrand and then the year after, how did that impact merchandise and apparel sales? I'm a consumer psychologist, so I wanna look at it very much inside the consumer's head and see, you know, is one approach more effective than another psychologically? But we're, we're working on, on that piece next. Uh, Cause we obviously we want to tell the story that may be going retro 
and taking that approach to a rebrand might be more valuable than the modern approach. And then just from a practitioner standpoint, you think you're doing a retro approach, but at least our data is showing that it's been perceived as modern. So I thought that was kind of interesting as well. Is that it? Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. My name is Natalia Brzezina. I'm an assistant professor of sport management. And today I have the pleasure to present to you uh, my research team dynamics in the NIL era. Uh, think about a college athletic team. What comes to mind? I bet the concept that you have in your head is that of a close knit group of individuals who are working together, sharing camaraderie, victories, and defeats, striving toward excellence. Now think about a college team in the era of name, image, and likeness. Name, image, and likeness is essentially three elements through which one can monetize their personal brand. Name, image, and likeness policy was put in place by the National Collegiate Athletic Association in July, on July 1st, 2021, allowing student athletes to monetize their personal brands. They were not allowed to do that before that moment because that was viewed as being in conflict with their amateur status. In the era of name, image, and likeness, the currency of success is athletic prominence, attractive physical appearance, and social media popularity. Combined, these elements can result in highly inequitable sponsorship income distribution between student athletes and potentially between teammates. This has generated concerns from coaches, industry practitioners, as well as academics. Surprisingly, despite the fact that personal branding essentially is a type of career behavior and evolves and emerges within the organizational environment, the interplay between personal branding processes and team dynamics have not been investigated before. It is important to investigate this perspective because team dynamics impact student athlete experience. They also impact performance of the team and are linked to financial outcomes. Instead, prior research on personal branding has mostly focused on consumer perspectives, individuals' strategies with building a brand, as well as legal and ethical issues. To bridge this gap, I conduct this research. It is guided by three research questions. First, what factors shape how student athletes interact in relation to NIL within their teams? Second, what are the distinct patterns of NIL-specific interactions within student athlete teams? And third, what are the consequences of these interactions? Uh, consistent with exploratory focus of this research, I pursue constructivist grounded theory approach, which essentially implies generating theory from data. And I conduct interviews with student athletes in different teams, um, sports, and institutions. My findings show that uh, their perceptions of the impact of NIL on team dynamics can be uh, uh, captured in three theoretical dimensions, which include contextual conditions, uh, intra-team NL-specific interactions, and outcome of NL interactions. So generally, my research shows that uh, external environment, broader social context, team culture, as well as uh, leadership influence impact how student athletes interact about NIL within their teams. When there is a strong team culture and explicit and programmatic discussions around behavioral frameworks within the NIL contest, overall this uh, generally is um, cultivating a collaborative orientation toward NIL. When those factors are lacking, this uh, can lead to competitive dynamics. In terms of intra-team NIL interactions, I identify four specific patterns. Those include joint pursuit, when student athletes pursue NL opportunities or uh, try to discover NL opportunities collectively, peer-to-peer -peer support, which includes moral support, exchange of information, exchange of feedback, uh, NL competition, when teammates feel like they are in contest with each other in terms of how well they perform in NL market, uh, they engage in social comparison, and avoidance of NL interactions when they engage in NL monetization but try to avoid interacting about it. In terms of the outcomes, I'm observing that when there is a collaborative orientation toward NIL, generally this resonates with a sense of bonding within the team and feeling supported through NIL pursuit. Uh, alternatively, when uh, there is a competitive or avoidance dynamic within the team, this can lead to an increased sense of inter-team conflict as well as a lack of perceived support. Overall, my research shows that 
Um, NIL in this day and age is not merely a component of student athlete individual identity construction, but also collective team identity because how student athletes interact in relation to NIL is now embedded within the broader team dynamic. Uh, thank you for your attention. Ah, uh, yes, please. Yes, so name, image, and likeness is essentially three elements through which an individual can monetize their personal brand. For example, uh, when we see uh, an athlete, professional, or collegiate co-producing uh, a brand or a line of products uh, with a brand where they put their name here, they're monetizing their brand. Uh, sorry, monetizing their name. If we see a commercial featuring an athlete here, they're monetizing their image. If you're thinking about uh, video games, uh, these are not real athletes playing there, but there may be a character who resemble um, an athlete. This is a monetization of their likeness. So before July 1st, 2021, uh, student athletes competing on varsity teams and colleges were not allowed to monetize their name, image, and likeness uh, because it was perceived as being contrary to amateurism status and amateurism principles. But then uh, with Evolution of college athletics uh, perspectives on what's acceptable within this amateurism model have changed. And now they can uh, receive money for sponsorship endorsements, uh, autograph sessions, uh, signing contracts with collectives, which essentially is uh, groups of fans and donors who are affiliated with the school and want to support athletes. So in this way, many student athletes have become able to um, monetize their personal brands and receive income that's kind of in addition to scholarships that they receive or other benefits that they receive um, as student athletes. So uh, generally, when we talk about name, image, and likeness, this is what uh, this refers to. Yes, please. Yes, yes. Some uh, collegiate athletes these days are millionaires. Uh, other student athletes are really struggling to secure any sort of sponsorship at all. And in this way, that really creates a dynamic where uh, you really have a variety of uh, incomes within the college athletic uh, landscape. So uh, this is what I'm trying to focus on here. Yes, great question. So I think um, in general terms, coaches cannot ignore this anymore. They have to explicitly address uh, what NIL is, how we are going to go about prioritizing NIL versus team activities versus um, athletic activities versus academics, because when coaches are trying to just stay away from it, um, overall, this leads to a dynamic where student athletes are trying to figure out how we are going to deal with this new thing. And oftentimes things can go wrong. So a coach really has to integrate uh, a framework for how we are going to treat it. And I think this is where that leadership influence come in. Do we uh, respect individuality? Do we respect individual choices? Do we um, encourage our athletes to put what's for the team above what's for the individual? Because how student athletes go about prioritizing their NAL versus everything else is going to reflect on team relationships. So uh, briefly, that would be... Um, the, the meaning of the coach in this context. And um, yeah, I think interviewing athletes from different teams, one of the most interesting examples that I came across was um, an example of a football team where a coach essentially decided that let's um, tackle an IL problem head on and the problems that can potentially arise in, in relation to team culture. So how about we create a special team meeting once a week where all student athletes are coming together to brainstorm what are some opportunities that we can pursue collectively and what are some opportunities that we can identify uh, that can be pursued individually. But in this way, the way that coach positioned it, you're not just working for yourself, you're working for the team because the more opportunities that are available to the team, the higher our profile is, the better recruits are going to come. So here we are working for the team. And I felt like they felt like they're all included, they're all in it. To me, that was very surprising to hear that this is what can be going on in this new context, but I think this is one of the examples of how coaches are really trying to get involved and manage the situation. So as in any other aspect, I feel like the role of the coach here is very hard to uh, overestimate. 
Good afternoon. My name is Lena Bat. I am from Alps, and I am going to talk to you about the exciting topic of property taxes here today and the impact on schools. So, oh yeah, very black, black for taxes here. <laughs> so, in this country, we really value the local nature of, of education, the local nature of governance of education. Community members get to feel that they have a much greater say in our local schools. And this extends to how we fund schools. And with about 44% of funding on average coming from local taxpayers, they do have a large say. This, depending on the state you're in, can actually vary from zero to 70%. So it matters. And one result of this system is the necessity for districts to put tax levy on the ballot. And so they have to get the local taxpayers to approve funding for schools. And these monies go for things like teacher salaries, instructional supplies. So they really matter. And the challenge becomes when community members are not willing to actually vote for these taxes and a school district goes into crisis. We know a little bit about that in Lawrence. And so in my research, I've been examining how the community context really matters in this problem. And I want to provide a recent example. In a school district in Illinois, where 70% of the monies for school come from local funding. So being able to pass those referenda really matter. And at the end of 2022, they had a situation where they had an expiring property tax levy. And so they were putting it on the ballot. And the messaging coming from the district was that your tax rates are going to go down. Bonds are about to expire. This tax is going to expire. So it's just really replacing it. And so all their messaging was about money. This failed. Instead, it was met with all of these claims from the community that the school district was just asking for more money. Taxes weren't going to go down. And that they were just being very wasteful and mismanaging their money. And so in order to understand how this community was really framing this conversation, I looked at social media. And it's amazing how much these debates now get played out on social media. And we've found through research that the context of community really matters whether or not the district is able to pass these property tax levies in order to continue to fund their schools. And so looking at Nextdoor, Facebook, letters to the editor, be some really interesting coding. I found out what conversations were happening in this community. Who was for it, who was against it, and why? So I could frame these conversations. I have three takeaways from this, that if you're in district administration, what you might want to pay attention to to help prevent this situation from coming is they put this tax levy on, it failed with that messaging, but then they put it up again six months later and it passed. The big difference was that all of a sudden they were actually sharing what they were gonna have to cut, lay off 200 teachers. They were going to have to shorten the school day, close the school, get rid of all athletics, get rid of clubs, music, art. And once the conversations became about tangible things, that mattered. So if you're in a district, pay attention to the conversations that are happening, such as, what are the people really talking about? We found some people saying that it wasn't so much that they didn't want to spend the money, they just didn't like the decisions the school was making, such as, and one of the quotes that I have up here, the district also chose to opt in to teaching comprehensive sex education when they could have opted out as many other Illinois school districts legally chose to do. Between this and this equity that they're pushing, academic excellence takes a back seat. It wasn't about the money. It was about what they cared about and their issues. Also, transparency really mattered. Once they actually started talking about what was going to get cut, the real situation that fiscally they were in as opposed to whether or not tax rates were going up or down, then people started paying attention and getting out and voting. Trust was also built once they became more transparent. Finally, when the district also started paying attention to the proponents and the arguments that they were making and the framings that they were making that 
if you have good solid schools that are well-funded, you can have a good, strong, healthy community, have a good workforce, keep your property values up, and started harnessing those arguments, it also passed. So if you're a school district administrator, pay attention to social media. Sometimes it's hard to read, but pay attention. And also understand your community in that context, because it's going to matter whether or not you can keep that district fiscally solvent. Thank you. Um, I actually did not expect that to come out as much, but I spent a lot of time reading all the posts, reading the letters to the editors, and was actually a bit surprised at how much that came out. And that there was, and I mean, this is in a time that it's post-COVID, and we are in a situation where there's this huge polarization about what the goal, I mean, it's been going on since schools began, but we are seeing this massive polarization about the role schools should be playing and what should be talked about and about the role of equity, about the role of race, about the role of gender. And we're seeing that now play out in the funding as well. Um, looking at another district before, that was not as much the conversation before COVID, but it has become much more so. Um, so um, what Dean Ginsburg is asking is about that local, the local as interest in schools is not necessarily um, coming out in research because people don't get out there necessarily and vote in the local school board elections, like those rates are really low. Um, and you're absolutely right also about the timing of the election. So one of them was in November and then the next one put on there was in April. And a large part of this particular community actually did come out. I did look at some of the rates because this became such a contentious issue and people were so feeling very strongly about it, especially much more the second time. Um, so I actually wonder, I have not really looked into that, but I wonder whether or not our interest and how we talk about them, how we discuss them, just maybe doesn't translate to voting. And that maybe that is something we should think more about of like that active engagement. So I think there is this assumption in, in this particular election that, oh, well, we've always had it. It will pass. That was the majority of people. And then when it failed, they were like, oh, they're closing schools. They're shortening school days. We actually do have to get out and vote. And that was kind of my third point. I don't know if I actually got to it, that school districts need to target those voters and make sure they get out. But um, having looked at different studies about referendum, those are major issues that they, it tends to be on these types of elections, the people that do get out and vote are the teachers and the people who are personally impacted unless it is an election year. Oh, yep, sorry. Oh, do we have to? Um, so the two that we have looked at, I'm working with a colleague at North Dakota on this one, and the two that we've looked at have actually been very divided. Like literally um, in the last election, this particular community that I shared about um, voted 50.1% Democrat. Um, so I have, so I mean, it's like, and it is extremely socioeconomically um, diverse and just with the different types of jobs there. It's a big university town, as well as there are major factories, huge insurance. So, I mean, it's just an interesting place. And I, I think this would be very interesting to look at in a much more um, homogenous situation. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, I'm Dr. Quincy Johnson, and I'm excited to share my presentation title, Optimizing Athletic Performance. 
the Jayhawk way. Thank you to Lisa and Jeannie for organizing this for us. Um, now, I'm sure you're wondering what Kate Bridges and athletic performance have in common, right? Um, but I hope I hope to provide some clarity here pretty soon. Do we have any cake connoisseurs in here? Any favorite flavors in here? Yeah. Um, so what if I told you that there's a key ingredient in cake that can improve strength, power, and speed? Get up arms, right? Okay, well, that's not quite the case. However, um, the layers of the cake and their tiers are analogous with the layers and tiers often utilized for sports performance research, which is one of my interests. Um, and then, <laughs> um, within those layers, right, there are, we, we utilize those layers to identify and organize key variables within our research approaches, right? Things like health history, body composition, flexibility, strength, power, speed, for most sports, for most athletes. And then we think of tiers, we can utilize those tiers to prioritize our layers. Um, so that was one analogy. I tried to bring that to the sports performance research that I do. And then now we're wondering, okay, so what, what is a bridge doing up there? Why do we, why do we need a bridge? So we utilize these layers and these tiers to bridge the gap, right, between um, performance, development, and assessment of the athlete. Um, and as we see on the right, we have a football athlete here from KU, and that's one of my passions, one of my interests. Um, we're starting up a new project titled the Gridiron Performance Project, the Science of American Football. Um, right now, we're focused on assessing and analyzing body composition characteristics movement capacity, strength, power, and speed, as I've mentioned, of the American football athlete. Um, I get questions all of the time. So why are you interested in the American football athlete? I began playing football when I was five years old. I'm from Oklahoma, by the way, so it's not uncommon to start playing football, contact football, very, very young. I was lucky to make it through my career with minor injuries, but I had several friends who tore ACLs, concussions. So this is where my line of research is going is um, dedicated towards. So whenever we think about the assessment aspect, why are assessments useful? They help answer questions and they help support the strength coach and the sport coach with their mission to develop athletes. Um, and so why is that developmental piece important? Um, previous research has shown, especially on American football athlete, um, the greatest, most significant improvements in strength, power, and speed occur from years one to two with a maintenance of two to three years in strength, power, and speed, and then beyond that, um, there's typically more specialization, specialization and support. So we have our assessment protocols that we utilize. We implement those to support the strength condition and coach to develop the athletes. And then I'm also interested in performance. Um, a lot of times, whenever you meet with a coach or an athlete, what are what are some of the questions we might ask? Maybe we have, we're concerned about their prior season, how many games did you win? How many touchdowns did you score? How many passes did you catch? So we're also interested in that performance piece and specific phase, phase specific characteristics um, as in relation to the season. So how do they differ from preseason to conference to postseason play? So I'm gonna open it up for any questions. Yes, so um, currently we have Connor McNally, who's assistant strength coach with KU football. He's in our PhD program and I'm advising him. So this is our first capstone project for gridiron performance, the science of football. Uh, within their weight room, they have technology. Um, I mean, years ago, we used to just look and look at an athlete lift a barbell or a dumbbell and say, yeah, that looks fast enough. Or yeah, that looks heavy enough. Now we have um, technology that's integrated on the racks with cameras and we can see exactly how fast the barbell moves. So we are creating load velocity profiles, um, number one for the team. And then we'll take it a step further and we'll look at starters versus non-starters. Then we'll take it a step further and then we'll look at position group specific characteristics. Um, anymore, you walk into a weight room, there's always some sort of technology or gadget. So that's our first project. 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's not my expertise, but we have some great collaborators in our lab. Um, something also unique about me is that I've been a strength coach for the last decade. Last season, I had uh, two female power lifters that were in high school. And that's when I became interested in the sports psych aspect. So I would imagine um, before too long, we'll, we'll be collaborating on the sports psychology piece. Yep. new pieces like gps units so right um i'm not a designer or developer but we utilize we utilize those gps units so global positioning system units um now it's a micro technology that you can put into shoulder pads and we can track how far athletes run how fast they run how many times they start stop change of direction and we can profile um, or assess practice how well are we preparing the athletes for the game and what are those game demands and based on their fitness level, what they're accustomed to. Should we provide more rest or should we should we really push it to help them develop and go a little bit further? So I would say GPS units. I brought a wearable. So uh, first of all, this is a Lope Pesa. Uh, it's a uh, Icelandic sweater. And uh, to the Icelanders, this symbolizes cultural pride. People wear them every day, all the time. And um, to them, it, it represents cultural pride, but without that strong element of nationalism. And then underneath here is my second wearable. <laughs> yeah, cue the stripper music, okay. <laughs> so uh, what this says, repeat after me, Tveta Redast. Very good. Um, and this symbolizes uh, a, a very strong Icelandic cultural tradition of conf complaint without conflict. Uh, almost every group you walk into, classroom, doesn't matter what, uh, you say something and then you're hit with a dozen complaints. So our poor student interviewers would say, tell me why you think Iceland is so creative. Well, I don't think it's so creative. I don't think our government supports us at all. Well, I think school was really boring. I don't think it was creative at all. And any group begins like that, lots of complaints. But then interestingly, there's usually a short time spent on some possible resolutions, but often they just skip right to, it'll all work out. It'll all work out. It'll all work out. And that is a that is a phrase you hear a lot. So the Creative Communities Project actually began with my uh, daughter informing me in 2014 that she was leaving the School of the Art Institute to immigrate to Iceland because there were more creative people there and that she couldn't find a place for herself in the United States. And she wanted me to financially support it. And I said, well, in return for my financial support, you need to present a project to me. And she said, okay, I'll find out why Iceland's so creative. Uh, so it began with Grace and I collaborating and we soon found out it was a much larger project. So the next summer I brought a research team made up of our doctoral students who are studying aspects of creativity and creative people. And we asked the question, why is Iceland so creative? And I'll skip over that part only to tell you what we learned, and that was that uh, it's not what you think. <laughs> that the general conclusion we got from all of our interviews was that Iceland is creative not because the nature is so beautiful, because six months of the year are spent slogging through the slush in the darkness, <laughs> and nor is it government policy, because as I said, everybody complains that the government doesn't, doesn't do enough, although from our point of view, they did plenty. Um, the reason they said that Iceland is so creative that there are more patents per capita than any country, why one out of eight Icelanders publish a book, they say is because of creative community. That they felt that they had, that everybody who wanted to be creative could find their people, gather with them and do things. 
So here's what we learned. We define creative communities as people creating together outside of institutions. So all of these are independent. What were the themes? The themes were spontaneous emergence. They emerged out of a few people coming together and going, oh, let's have a band or let's, uh, let's make a maker space in the art museum. Let's, um, uh, let's just do this. Leaders are admired for their expertise rather than their personality characteristics. Some of them you wouldn't suspect would be leaders, but if they had the expertise that's wanted, they're the leaders. They have a lateral organizational structure. It's very flat and many, even people who are actually the leaders won't call themselves that. Um, and, and it's flat and they don't tend to publish hierarchies. Uh, decisions are made by consensus and democratic decision-making with the emphasis upon consensus. And finally, the people that make them up tend to be people who are very independent with open personalities and, they're, and they tend to be a mixture of people who are very individualistic, but very uh, much interested in being in a community with other people like this. When we went back to the literature to investigate each of these dynamics, we asked, where can we find literature on this? There's very sparse literature on creative communities. Where we found these themes was in the literature of crisis and disaster. And if you want a good book to read, Rebecca Solnitz, Solnitz A Paradise Built in Hell, says that, uh, and, and anthropologists now agree, that when humans are in a state of crisis, that they tend to come together spontaneously, that people with expertise are admired and are, are, are brought forward and emerge. They tend to have not much organizational structure. They use consensus. And generally, the people who join up in the groups that are fixing things in a disaster tend to be independent people who really value sociality. Um, so that's what we learned. And I do have to say that uh, one, of the, uh, one of the artists said, well, what do you think of the disaster might be that artists have here? And a writer answered, capitalism. <laughs> So, I'll open up for questions. Thank you. Questions? Oh, uh, they've gone off several times when I've been there. Yeah, it's a slow volcano rather than an eruptive one, so it's not too deep. Uh, well, actually, uh, they evacuated the entire 3,500 uh, persons in Vindavik in two hours. They gave the alert at midnight to get out. By 2 a.m., every individual was out. And yeah, they function quickly, very quickly, because the community comes together and says, this is what we have to do. Can you imagine trying to evacuate Eudora in two hours? <laughs> Other questions? Yes, they have a, a curriculum that's called the Innovation Education Curriculum, not all schools, but most of them, in which all kids learn to use tools from kindergarten upward and to solve a problem. First, a problem that their classroom has, like the bulletin boards are boring, uh, to by the time they are in high school, in their uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth years, they're solving community and societal problems. Um, and uh, every kid learns how to knit, boy and girl, and every kid learns how to use power tools. And if you want to be really horrified, watch your own four-year-old grandson sitting on top of a playhouse using a nail gun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of that. Other questions? Okay, I'll end with, a, oh yeah, go ahead. Oh, please. <laughs> I, uh, I did this on my sabbatical, the, most of the creative communities interviews after the summer were done on my sabbatical. Um, Fulbright, a Fulbright scholarship is a wonderful opportunity that I hope all of you will apply for sometime in your life, a chance to meet new colleagues. Um, the embassy does a superb job. There are activities every week. They help you find places to live. It's, um, 
it's a, a warm group of people. And I've heard that from other Fulbright scholars that it's a life-changing experience. And it was for me. Yes. Oh. Mm -hmm. to different kinds of crises because the crises and disasters that have been studied have been the ones we know about you know earthquakes floods that kind of thing but i would love to see budget disasters in the covid pandemic there were elements in neighborhoods in in neighborhoods there were elements of it not so much in the society as a whole yeah well thanks so much Hello, good afternoon. My name is uh, Nicholas Mitchell. I'm assistant professor of curriculum studies in the Department of Curriculum Teaching. And just to get it out of the way, this painting here is, um, but it was done by uh, Jean-Simon Bartholomew. Uh, it's Alexander Court cutting the Gordian knot, which allegedly happened in 333 BCE, where he went to Gordium. And the legend was if you could, whoever could untie this knot, was destined to be the ruler of Asia. So he just pulled out his sword and cut it. So, and it's become a metaphor for a simple solution to a complex problem. And in education, we face many complex problems. We have many Gordian knots, but possibly none of them more tangled and larger than how do we actually teach identity? And this, I mean, this is the question that really sits at the center of so many debates from critical race theory to how do we teach gender in, a, in a social studies classes in K-12 to how we even teach the story of America. So what's the actual question? How do we teach identity, which is to say, how do we teach intersectionality? So now before we actually cut the Gordian knot, we actually have to understand what the problem actually is outside of the culture war and everything else that you would see you know, on news. So the problem that we face with teaching identity and intersectionality in the teaching profession is really because we have made a critical pedagogy error. We try to present what is messy as if it were clean, all right? So what do I mean by that? We tend to think of identity in these neat little boxes, right? So this person's black, this person's white, this person's queer, this person's heterosexual, right? And what flows from this is a tendency to talk about supremely complex subjects like privilege and marginalization using that same box method. So white is privileged, black is marginalized, um, heterosexual is privileged, queer is marginalized. And then we stop, and then that's it. This approach, teach, this approach to teaching identity mangles identity, but it also supremely misrepresents how we actually, it, it misrepresents intersectionality itself. So how do we cut this Gordian knot? What's the sword, right? We present what is messy as what it is. It's messy. Don't try to clean it up. So how do we do that? Well, we steer into the messy, by adopting this idea from a scholar named uh, Goost Yep over at San Francisco State University, it's called thick intersectionality. And it, we do this because it tells us that we must remember that all identity is simultaneous. It's all happening at once. And that all identity is lived. We forget that sometimes, do we not? The problem with those neat, clean boxes is that we don't smash them back together at the end, so we miss critical parts of teaching identity. We miss that no one is one category, none of us in this room are one thing, okay? And that those categories combined, AKA intersect, hence intersectionality, in ways that impacts everything about our lives from the food we eat to how we even exercise agency in the world. But most importantly, we miss that our students do not live in clean, neat boxes. They live in messy realities where you can be privileged and marginalized at the same time. So a question I'm often, uh, often asked by students is why do some poor white people get angry when white privilege comes up? I mean, is it not true that they possess white privilege? Yes, they do possess white privilege, but it doesn't stop there. That it, 
there's other parts of this because that's not where their lived experience stops. They are poor, so we cannot actually ignore that deprivation that causes that suffering because of one form of privilege. Another way to think about it is if I'm a black man from, from Louisiana, born on the banks of the Mississippi River, and if you were to ask me and another black person who grew up in Lawrence, do we think this town has bad race relations? If you ask me, I would say no. And if you ask the person, let's say for argument, you ask the person from Lawrence and they say yes, which one of us is telling the truth? Both. Why? Because we are talking about our own lived experience. I'm from next door to Klan country. So I'm used to a like very overt form of racism. What if the racism here is subtle? We must account for diversity within diversity. And we can only do that if we account for how people live their entire identities. Thick intersectionality challenges us to remember this messy truth. That is how we cut, we cut this knot. And if we adopt this view and this application of intersectionality, if we resolve to build our pedagogy on a commitment to teach messy things as being messy, which is to say we steer into complexity, then we escape these essentialist monoliths that dog education and the popular culture right now. And we teach students to recognize their own complexity as well as the, com the commonalities with each other. Because in that intersectionality, it always leads to what is our one common point? We are human. Thank you, I'll take your questions. Sir. So I, uh, I'm a black man, Jamaican man. Mm -hmm. As a refugee, fresh in the middle of the world, and then the early government was trying to come. I think I'm asking the brothers and sisters to welcome me from the world. That's the one that's the furthest from the vision of God, the vision of God. So my lived experience and my experience. Mm -hmm. But I have to learn not to use judgment, action, those right and wrong. They do not represent the rest of the government. So if you don't tell me about a little experience one time, you have to learn that you know what you are saying or doing. So, so the humanity calls us for how I think about it. Mm. Not Yes. Um, the question I was asked is if uh, if I could unpack how uh, steering into the messiness resolves with uh, the common intersection of being human. Well, I'm a big I'm a big believer in uh, the idea of critical diversity, which is so much about diversity. What we call culture, any form of diversity you can think of, is really people just different ideas of being human. That's what our culture, that's what all our identities are. So through understanding this diversity and steering into that messiness and sometimes that conflict, we actually start discovering the, you know, the commonalities because the, the default position of humanity is its diversity. But at the same time, at the end of the day, we are still this creature, you know, we're, you know, we're the primate that writes poetry trying to understand itself that speaks all these different languages and thinks in all these different terms and feels. But in order to wrap your head around that, to talk of, you know, be able to talk about the, you know, the experience of being a refugee or, or to even just be able to empathize with it, sympathize with it, not dismiss it. You have to acknowledge that sometimes these experiences are, are different from your own, but that beneath it, there is, there's human commonality. You know, like the way I like to think of it is, uh, 
you know, the um, the heterosexual couple and the queer couple both cry when their child dies because that pain is real. That is their humanity, even though everything around it is different. And if we don't reject that and we steer into that messy, within all that messy, we find a solution rather than pretending so much of us is unintelligible to the other. I hope that I hope that's a, a, a satisfactory answer. That's a great question, uh, Doctor. Any other questions before I like run out of here due to embarrassment? Yes, I'm part of the record that Sir? Uh, we use the metaphor of one slide, the only right way to <laughs> I mean, I just, I just pull that off the internet. Um, <laughs> I just, I just, I just know who it is. Oh. If there are no, if there are no other questions, thank you for your time. Hello, everyone. I'm Min Young Kim uh, from the Department of Curriculum and Teaching. Um, so let me begin by asking a question to you all. Yeah, this is what it's supposed to be. Okay. <laughs> All right. But thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what are the first images that comes to mind when you hear the word argument? Mm -hmm. Argument. Okay. Perhaps um, some of you envision an image like this or, or this while others may picture it differently. But generally and traditionally, we tend to associate argument to, uh, with concepts like winning over or combating the other. Um, about two decades ago, Deborah Tennant reported and analyzed what she termed the argument culture that is prevalent in the United States, uh, where criticism attack or opposition are the predominant, if not the only way to, uh, on, uh, the only way of responding to people or ideas. Uh, Tennant documented how this pervasive argument culture not only influences, but is also influenced by social, cultural, and political realms, but also academia and even in kindergarten classrooms. Um, fast forward to today, and we find ourselves in a still divisive, contentious, and oftentimes disruptive cultural and political landscape. This perpetuates the phenomenon of people retreating into the, their ideological silos, unwilling to compromise with those who hold different views. What particularly captivates and concerns me is that this societal construction of argumentation shapes the way we teach and learn arguments within classroom. Um, research has shown that students exhibit a my side bias in their classroom argument. And as a former high school language arts teacher and a debate team coach in South Korea, and as a current teacher educator in the United States, um, I've witnessed a discombative stance and argumentation prevailing in classrooms on both sides of Pacific Oceans. And this observation motivated me to explore alternative approaches to teaching argumentation that foster adolescent as an active civic participant who has willingness and capacity to listen to viewpoints of others. As a qualitative researcher, I collaborated with middle and high school English language arts teachers to delve into this issue. Uh, one intriguing scholarly concept that emerges was the idea of a uh, dialogic space. Dialogic space is a space where we see, feel, or think of things from at least two points of view at once. So it is shared space of mutual resonance, and it is also a space where ideas can resonate together merge in some ways or clash in others to stimulate the emergence of new ideas. So what does it look like to cult cultivate a dialogue sta space in classrooms where argumentation is taught and learned? It looks like when students continued along a parallel line and eventually reached a deadlock in their argumentation, instead of allowing them conclude with a simple, you're wrong, I'm right, but the teachers can prompt students to pause and reflect on the beliefs and assumptions that underpin their arguments 
And this can help students to understand how their life experiences personal histories and diverse backgrounds may have shaped the specific grounds and belief that inform their arguments. Uh, teachers can encourage students to temporarily suspend their perspectives and ask them to actively listen to and engage with others' viewpoints and invite them to understand why the others construct specific beliefs and worldviews which may or may not be the same as theirs. So through my research, I found that when teachers are deliberate in designing um, their argument classrooms to expand and enrich the dialogue space, students can showcase um, the capacity for mutual resonance, even when holding different perspectives on a given issue. So as one student remarked at the conclusion of a unit that I observed, we had different beliefs about almost everything. Recognizing, acknowledging these differences and where they may come from marks the beginning of opening, deepening, and widening the dialogic space in and out of the classrooms. Thank you. Any questions? So if I understand correctly, how can, how can students, um, or could you repeat that again, sorry. Right, so uh, that, that's a great, uh, great question. So um, maybe the entry point for that is that um, when, we, when we need to open dialogue space or when the dialogue space needs to be open, there needs to be a dialogue gap, right? Uh, it could be uh, like prompt that invites controversial ideas or it could be some uh, like models that we have to argue about. So at least there need to be some dialogic gaps uh, where people engage in uh, articulating and developing their ideas and, and maybe just conversing around uh, or around it together. Uh, so maybe that dialogic gap be the entry point for, for this space. That wasn't... Oh, so the question was, uh, did I train teacher to create the dialogue space? Actually, this was an uh, ethnographic study. So I didn't enter this space or classroom with this specific concept in mind. Um, I worked with teachers and that was part of the professional development project. But the project was to help teachers to, um, to help them incorporate argument in teaching literature. So I have observed um, like more than 10, uh, I was part of the project team, we observed more than 10 uh, high school ELA teachers. And one classroom that I observed, the teacher actually did something um, phenomenal in terms of creating dialogue space. And I wanted to name that and I wanted to know what it is. So I just searched all these literatures and maybe uh, this term dialogue space might uh, describe that and then maybe some provide some implications for all of us who might be interested in teacher education and the students learning in that space. So that's how I get to this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a great question. So yeah, uh, in one of the articles that's just accepted about this one, actually I analyzed students writing, argument in writing, whether they uh, show any differences after they engage in this uh, dialogue space and argumentation. And um, it was evident that they have uh, shown more articulation and sophistication in their reasoning. So they really um, acknowledge what others might have, how others might have different understandings about this specific issue, 
but still I think this way because of this disease. So they, they really um, demonstrate that kind of recognition and awareness in their writing. Uh, so more sophisticated version of their argumentation. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for hanging around. My name is uh, Susan Harvey. I'm an associate pro professor in the Department of Health Sport and Exercise Sciences. The title of my presentation today is So Wasted. If you thought I was going to wrap up today's presentation by telling stories and showing pictures of my colleagues in Robinson, you're going to have to wait till next year on my presentation on Totally Wasted. So I'm still collecting data on everything. So instead, what I want to talk about today is food waste. So we waste a massive, massive amount of food in the United States, 133 billion, that's billion with a B, pounds of food. So hopefully, no, hopefully everybody uh, ate their lunches today and there's no food waste out there. Um, we have a lot of data on household food waste and uh, consumer facing businesses. We don't have a, lo a whole lot of data on what we see in the, at the school level. The few handful of studies that we do see um, mirror what we also see with consumer facing businesses as well as households that we throw away at the school level a lot of fruits and vegetables followed by proteins and milk. So I wanted to see at a local level what kind of data we would see if we went into one of our local schools um, and collected food waste uh, data. So while I don't have a wearable on today, for over a two week uh, time period, I strapped on uh, galoshes, rubber boots, and uh, a rubber uh, suit and rubber gloves and measured food waste at one of our local high schools. Um, we saw a massive amount of food waste. So no intervention. We just wanted to see what were what was being thrown away. And we saw a lot of, of you know, food that we could not reuse or could not be recovered, but a lot of whole fruits and vegetables. Um, a lot of unopened bag of chips and uh, a lot of uh, wrapped sandwiches still. So certainly food that could have been recovered uh, and diverted to feed some of our food insecure students. So within that first week, uh, we saw just under a quarter of a pound of food um, that was wasted on average per tray, quite a bit of food. Um, and that ranged anywhere from zero pounds of food waste to just over two pounds of uh, food waste. So people not eating anything. So what we wanted to do with that second week period is we wanted to see is if we did a simple intervention by putting uh, table tents on the tables and how about a food donation box uh, that's placed um, right before the trash cans, would that make a difference? And what we found may not seem like much to you, but it was pretty meaningful to us. On top of that, we're still analyzing this data. And what is what's really intriguing for us as as that week went on of the intervention, food waste became less and less. And what we also noticed was students backtracking. I, I was able, as I was switching out my rubber gloves, um, I took a picture of this student who uh, on his tray, he had two whole apples. This is what we were seeing a lot of in week one. He backtracked and threw those apples in our donation box. On top of that, we then had teachers who were coming over to the donation box saying, can we take some of this? We've got students that we know really need this food. So let's look at it at, from like a back viewpoint of view or a top-down approach. When we talk about reimbursable school meals, they are reimbursed. Students have to have at least three of five components on their tray. At the elementary and middle school levels, this is usually served to them, all five components on a tray. At the high school level, it's offer versus serve. That's a requirement. That's meant to give students, older students, more choice. So for a reimbursable meal, they have the choice, but they still have to have at least three of those five components. The idea behind that is meant to reduce food waste. We're not seeing a lot of reduction in food waste. So if you look at USDA's website, they have on there tips and information for how schools cafeteria workers, food service workers, on how they can uh, reduce food waste. The problem with this is, is there's a massive shortage of these essential workers across our nation. This includes lo is included locally too. So we can't expect them to have one more thing on their plate um, to do. Why not instead take something simple like what we did and put it in the hands of students? Because this makes a difference at that school level. 
the school that we were at, 31, over 30% 30 of the students qualify for free or reduced lunches. And I might also add, this uh, This is a school district, so everybody's going to know one of the schools that we're at. Um, they have open lunch period. So most of the students leave campus to get lunch. But they're really looking at tamping that down because of concerns from the community and keeping it, uh, uh, reverting it to a closed lunch. That's just going to add to that wasted food. So we need to figure out how can we involve students and have them take ownership and do something simple like this to divert some of that food from the landfill and into feeding uh, hungry students. I will add one more thing. We did not measure milk. I wish we would have. I, you know, hindsight, I thought this is going to be, I, we can't measure milk. We just don't have the capacity to do it. And we don't. I wish we would have because that first week we threw away hundreds, hundreds of unopened milk cartons. That second week when we did this intervention, those hundreds, hundreds of, of milk cartons overflowed that donation box. And the track and field coaches said, we could really take this for our athletes. Is that okay? Absolutely. So that's it. And I will open it up for questions. Thank you. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you eat those. Everybody eat their food today, I hope. Uh, yes, Susan, I saw your name. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we have, so there's, uh, that's a good comment um, on just that notion of, of liability, right? But we have federal laws that protect um, that. It's, it's called the Bill Emerson Food Donation Act. It was put into act by um, former President Bill Clinton. Um, and so we do have those liability protections in place. On top of that, any food that's recovered, there's uh, tax incentives. Uh, so if the school were not to repurpose this and divert it to students that need it, um, it, it, they, they could receive tax incentives for the donation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the 73% of vegetables, I think it's just goes back to the being kids. They just don't like the vegetables. They, the look of it, the appeal of it. I mean, students were getting salad and that was really disappointing. It's just to see the amount of salad that was being thrown away. Uh, we, sir, I mean, we do, we haven't gotten that far yet. And, and you know, with this one, I, I think we saw a lot of whole fruits and milk. That was that was the, the crux of it and an open bag of chips. Um, but we didn't, just with our capacity, I, I, you know, next time I'd like to measure milk, I'd also like to measure uh, actually how much of each food component is actually, break it down according to those food groups a little bit more, um, I, you know, how do you make them more palatable? Again, that goes back to the to the onus on the food service workers. And so how do we create less work for them at the get-go? I will also say uh, the, the food service people came up to me afterwards and they said, we have more silverware than we've ever had at the end of the week because um, kids just toss it too. And so we were getting the trays and then putting aside the silverware. So there's a lot of napkins, there's silverware that's getting thrown away, um, a lot of food. And we did not, we didn't measure um, if students brought their, their home lunches either. We just measured what, what was coming out of the cafeteria. Yeah. Oh, thank you. It was gross. It was gross. Gross. It, it, but, but it was fun. It was fun. The the rubber suit, yes. <laughs> right? Yeah, that anything bacon flavored too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Gandhi. Oh, from my last round. So yeah, so we did an evaluation that that took a while because if you remember when I presented on that, that hit right before the pandemic hit um, and then that shut everything down. 
So we did do, we were able to do an evaluation uh, that went through the spring and summer, um, and we're still wrapping up, just kind of cleaning up that data and looking at it, but uh, looking at comparisons across the different restaurants, that'll be interesting for us to see. Yeah, thanks for remembering that one. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>